Greetings, everyone. My name is Matt Adams. I am the president of the Visual Arts Alliance. VAA was founded in 1981 as an all-volunteer arts nonprofit that provides education and exhibition opportunities to Houston area artists and collectors. We do this through a number of programs. For example, our monthly educational program, which we're doing today. We also produce professionally juried exhibits. We also have monthly sketch socials and we have monthly critique nights. All of these events are free and open to the public. You should follow us on Facebook, go to our website and sign up for our newsletter, which is also free and open to the public. So we have a lot going on. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I will get you up to the minute information for the organization of what we're doing. Uh, but since this is going to live in perpetuity on our YouTube channel, I want to go ahead and get into the educational program. Uh, so with that said, our program's chairman, uh, James Booker, uh, over to you, please. Yes. So today from the Blackford Museum, we have Chief Director and Senior Curator Steve Maticio and Assistant Curator Tyler Blackwell. So they will, they will be sharing the development behind their curation process and some of their current installations that they have at the, at the Blackford Museum. So without further ado, Steve Maticio and Tyler Blackwell. All right, thank you very much, James. And thank you, Matt. And thanks to everyone at VAA for hosting us today and joining us. Um, I just want to say a few words about the Black Art Museum before we jump into our virtual tour of the current exhibitions. So the Blaffer was founded in 1973. We reside on the campus of the University of Houston. And the Blaffer was initially founded from the collection of Sarah Campbell Blaffer, who donated a number of works from her European collection of 16th to 19th century work. Um, but over the course of our evolution, that collection eventually moved to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, where it now resides and it has its own dedicated galleries. And the Blaffer Art Museum became non-collecting museum dedicated exclusively to contemporary art. In 2012, we completed a major renovation to expand and update our exhibition spaces. And today we present about six to eight exhibitions per year. We like to say that we are always free and we're very proud of that. We are, at, we are located within a campus that has 47,000 students and one of the most diverse campuses in one of the most diverse cities in the country. And we really strive for our exhibition program to reflect all of that diversity, all the many dimensions of art making. And so we're really excited to bring three of these to you today. These are three of our current exhibitions that will all be on display in person until March 13th. So if you do like what you see and you want to see it all in person, you've got a little bit more time. Um, but today we're, we're pleased to walk you through in this virtual forum. So I'm going to hand it over first to our associate curator, Tyler Blackwell, who curated our major sort of flagship exhibition on the first floor, Molly Zuckerman Hartung's Comic Relief. So I'll hand off to Tyler. Thank you, Stephen. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tyler. And Yes, please uh, come and visit our exhibitions. We just have a few, uh, I guess, just a bit over a week left um, in these current slate of exhibitions. And I'm just gonna share my screen here shortly. Uh, sorry, one second. There we go. Uh, excellent. So um, very briefly, we're gonna, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the, the process of the exhibition and working with um, the artist Molly Zuckerman Hartung. And I, I think part of what Stephen will speak about too is, is thinking what it means to sort of work with the artist to think about a project. Um, Molly Zuckerman Hartung is um, what we would consider a, a mid-career artist. Um, and this exhibition is the first major museum survey that has been put together of her work. Um, I had known Molly's work from many years spent in Chicago. I came from Chicago to Houston and Molly um, was a sort of 
leading artist in the in the community. Um, I never met her and in my years there while she was also there, um, but I was very familiar with her work and had seen it in multiple venues. And when I arrived in Houston, uh, Molly was at the very top of my list of artists whose work I thought was sort of underappreciated, underexplored. Um, and it there became an opportunity for me to think about mounting an exhibition of her work. Um, here's an image of Molly, so you can see her. Um, and so this began when I arrived in Houston, I, I, I initiated a conversation with her and we began what became a three year long um, project, uh, which is the, the completion of this exhibition and then also an accompany, accompanying catalog um, that uh, is released at, simultaneously with the exhibition. And this project is quite um, substantial uh, for the Blaffer and for, for me as a curator and for Molly as the artist. It, it contains uh, some 120 odd objects that range from paintings uh, and sculptures to works on paper, to photographs, to writings, um, as well as everything in between. Uh, Molly was very active in the underground punk feminist scene, uh, Riot Girl, which originated in the Pacific Northwest in the Was Olympia, Washington area, and was very active in that community, um, which was sort of uh, very, I mean, like I mentioned, punk uh, sensibility of uh, taking down cultural norms and boundaries, especially male dominated power structures. Um, and it was a very close knit community, a sort of third wave feminist movement. Um, and it became a, a, a movement that stretched across the United States and, and traveled to different places around the globe. Um, this was a very formative period in Molly's life. Um, this was in the beginning in the early 1990s um, and continuing throughout the decade. And, um, and this sort of punk sensibility, this notion of, um, of fighting against norms uh, became a thread that I think it traversed through her practice. She later decided to study art. She was first a student um, of French literature and French philosophy and became an artist much, uh, not, I shouldn't say much later, but um, later in, in her 20s and eventually made her way to Chicago from Olympia, Washington, where she studied at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, where she obtained her master's degree, uh, her MFA. And so this view is a view as you walk into the Blaffer. Um, this is our first floor. Um, and I hope that many of you, if you have not visited, you will visit. This is um, this large tapestry work you see sort of here um, on the right hand of your screen. Uh, it can be seen from the streets through the, our windows. And then you enter into this lobby space and you're greeted by this painting on the far left. Um, which is uh, what she calls, you can see it here on the right, um, Chris Rock Oscars, which is an image that she, a painting that she made while, she, while Chris, Chris Rock was hosting the Oscars, I think in 2016 or 17. And um, I don't have a direct image of this painting, but uh, we placed it at the very beginning because we liked the, the idea, the sort of jokiness of uh, Chris Rock being our host of the exhibition, someone that will lead us through. Um, as well as this notion of a, a figure being on a stage um, in front of an audience. And you can certainly see aspects of, of that in this painting. So um, thinking of the artist here, Molly, a sort of stand in for Molly with these heels uh, that becomes a figure that that is a through line through the practice. And then immediately to the left of the painting, um, are a series of uh, 95 missives that are, are a, a direct sort of relation to uh, Martin Luther's uh, 95 theses. Um, <clears throat> Molly wrote this, this uh, set of 95 sort of points of interest that were relevant for her, but um, this has become a tool for professors, teachers of painting and drawing uh, throughout the country. Um, and this is, this is how, uh, visitors are invited to enter into the exhibition by encountering Chris Rock and then by having a chance to read these 
um, these ideas of Molly's um, that speak to many ideas that are seen throughout the exhibition and also gives the viewer, the visitor, a sense of how important the history of painting is and how Molly sort of seriously takes upon herself to think about um, considerations of what paintings can be as well as uh, the intersections between the written word and painted objects. Um, Molly is also a very prolific writer. And I just need to make sure that I know how long I am speaking here. I can't see my clock, I apologize. Stephen, can I ask you, do you see, is, is the PowerPoint still in full presentation mode or is it back in the slide mode? Okay. Yeah, it's slide mode, Tyler. Okay. Um, so this is the view of the exhibition as you enter. Um, you're confronted by this large painting that, sa that seemingly says no. Um, the painting is from 2013 uh, and it is titled Notley and it's actually an homage to the, to the poet Alice Notley. Um, the exhibition, which, which uh, I didn't speak too much about the title and I can, I'm happy to, to go back to that a little bit, um, is called Comic Relief. And so there is a sort of humor that is intrinsically um, fused throughout the exhibition. And so this notion of entering an exhibition um, of an artist's work, a sort of mid-career survey, and then being immediately confronted with no um, was a sort of joke that Molly and I were very interested in. Um, this is an homage, like I mentioned, to the poet Alice Notley, and it also sets the stage for a number of other works um, in terms of if, as we understand, this is an, an, an allusion homage to an important literary figure in Molly's life. And that love of literature and the sort of consideration of the written word of the, of the book as a sort of device. Um, Molly spent a lot of time uh, working in used bookshops. And like I mentioned, her first, uh, her first sort of field of study was French literature and philosophy. So she is an, um, a very active, uh, and especially early in her life, an active consumer of all things literature, all things theory. Um, especially feminist and queer theories. And so the sort of device of a book, and you can sort of see in this, in this image here of the no painting, that there is a sort of central line that divides the N and the O, that is a sort of central hinge um, that becomes another sort of theme throughout the exhibition um, of a sort of central device that holds, holds information together that mimics the book um, form. Um, this, another sort of joke here for Molly and I is to think about the sort of extreme largeness of the no painting next to this very small um, pinhole photograph, which is actually a, the earliest work in the exhibition, uh, which is from 1994, I believe. And this is a self-portrait that Molly made while she was sort of in the throes of uh, participating in Riot Girl. Um, so again, sort of centering this idea of this punk sensibility that we can sort of see in the no painting, this sort of notion of a, of a palette that is very grungy and gritty um, with silvers and dark colors, as well as this notion of, of a sort of torn or ripped aesthetic. Um, a, again, a sort of through line that continues throughout the work. Um, so from the very beginning, we understand Molly as, as this participant in this scene um, that uh, has essentially created a body of work that it can be translated as um, a sort of punk sensibility toward the history of painting. Um, this is our, our view as we turn to the right, enter into the exhibition, and you can see um, a number of major paintings by the artists. Here are two instances um, of the sort of central device that I mentioned, the sort of backbone or, or um, spine uh, that can both allude to like a human, a, a bodily backbone, as well as the sort of book device that I mentioned. And especially on the, the painting on the left here, um, we see uh, the central device of this vertical form um, that has quite literally different 
um, images that are inserted into it. So how can a painting hold multiple um, multiple modes of information and therefore contain multitudes of histories of ideas? And this becomes Molly is very the, the painting for Molly becomes the place where she can think through ideas and and um, the paintings become containers in many ways of, of all of her ideas about the history of painting, the history of art, as well as her own um, studies of, of theories that I, that I have mentioned earlier. Um, they become quite complex and quite overwrought, uh, which is another sort of theme, this notion of, of something, of a painting that is, that is quite literally sagging or, or filled with information that, um, relates to how maybe we as humans sort of um, our, our brains are, are full of information, are full of swirling ideas. Uh, and, lot, and Molly's paintings have been described as, as looking like Molly's trying to paint her way out of her own head. Um, so this is a sort of grouping of works uh, sort of spanning approximately 2007 to 2000 and 15, these are smaller paintings. Molly works from the very small, um, the painting on the far left uh, with the, that's in the middle row on, on the far left uh, with the sort of uh, zigzagging arm, um, which is called extending is, is pretty small. Um, and then of course the Notley painting, our first image, the no painting is, is enormous, you know, some uh, 10 feet wide or longer. Um, so, I think Molly does not privilege uh, the very small paintings or the very large paintings. Every opportunity to sort of think through an idea um, immediately gets translated into whatever size, whatever form seems most apropos. Um, I'm just going to zoom in. Uh, this painting is called Puberty um, from 2007, 2008. Um, these are some of the, I'm just going to show some images of the paintings that are in that constellation of paintings. And Molly and I work together. I should say um, she is very prolific, uh, very active in her practice, and this exhibition is, is is certainly a culmination of three years of dialogue, collaboration, arguing, uh, and discussion about which objects uh, should be included um, amongst the many hundreds of objects that she has made over the course of her career. Um, I'm just going to sort of work our way through the exhibition. Um, this is on the opposite side of the large no painting, um, a sort of nice scene here of three major paintings, um, including the center one, which is uh, called Comic Relief, which is what the show is, is named after. Um, we also enjoyed this idea of um, the sort of doubling of the words Comic Relief um, as we know them. Um, and sort of something that is uh, funny, as uh, something that is inserted into maybe a sad or um, dark situation as a, as a way of feeling, uh, feeling a bodily relief, a sort of exhale. Um, and then also this notion of relief, meaning um, the physicality of something that has like a, a, an art object that has relief, a flat object that has a protrusion, um, a relief. So quite literally thinking about a convention of painting as being a flat object and Molly jokingly has inserted um, these three sort of clownish arms, which she has likened to three musketeers, three stooges um, emerging from this painting. So uh, quite literally the painting has relief. Um, it's reaching down to the ground. It's sagging down to the ground. It's a sort of funny gesture. Um, the painting also of course has homages to a number of other artists. Um, Molly is a, very reverential art history student, a, a, his, a student of the history of abstract painting, certainly. And so we see the sort of spills and the bleeding here of these uh, pigments. And it's an homage to Helen Frankenthaler and Morris Lewis, um, as well as more contemporary artists that many of you may be familiar with, like Mary Weatherford. Um, so Molly's, Molly's practice is always sort of constantly thinking about what has come before her, um, and how can she utilize those ideas uh, um, and many times appropriate those ideas to um, create a new point of conversation or 
to sort of reference and then uh, totally turn on to turn an artist's ideas on its head. Um, this is another major painting that is called History Painting for the New Queer Subject. Um, Molly is a is a very um, as maybe you can tell, a very cerebral thinker. Um, and this, at one point in the in the mid aughts, so, so 2015, Molly had begun teaching at the sort of acclaimed Yale School of Art um, at a moment when a sort of queer aesthetic was becoming a more mainstream uh, way of thinking and making for young art students, and and this notion of reclaiming or or um, performing a, a an outward queerness. Uh, was becoming more acceptable and a more sort of uh, very public facing genre aesthetic um, of making. And so Molly made this painting. It, you can see the word on the left side of the painting, the word queer, um, which is from a from a poster that the Yale School of Art students were they had, they had mounted an exhibition um, about about a, a queerness. And so this, painting became a sort of amalgamation um, of many different ideas. And I, uh, as I mentioned, Molly is a sort of gatherer um, of ideas and, and histories and gestures and, and images. Um, and this is another sort of instance here of thinking about a sort of uh, unusual, the sort of queerness, as Molly would say, of Cezanne's bathers. She's quite literally inserted these bathers. Uh, you can see on the right side of her painting, um, she's appropriated some of Cezanne's uh, figures into this larger painting, which has many different other images. You see some pulp fiction, some queer pulp fiction um, on the far left. Um, so again, a sort of amalgamation, a gathering, um, an assemblage, if you will, of, of images, ideas. And I'm just including an image here so you can sort of see the relief again of this painting. This is a very busy and full painting with, with objects. You see some Home Depot paint uh, uh, sample sticks um, that are inserted into this painting as well as this, this piece of uh, I don't know if she would call it rope or, or a sort of string. Um, we move into, that's actually Molly and her partner there on the left in that image. Uh, this is a view into the, the sort of second large space, um, which I need to speed up my speaking a little bit. Um, uh, this is a, a, in this gallery is includes a wall of, um, objects that were made sort of throughout the course of her career from the mid nineties, as she is participating in Riot Girl and thinking about maybe what does it mean to make drawings or make her first paintings um, to the present. And so this, this wall here, this sort of uh, purplish wall contains objects throughout, throughout her career as a sort of, my thinking was, if, if the book structure is, is such an important structure, I wanted this wall, which sort of is situated in the very center of the whole exhibition to sort of function again as a sort of spine laying on its side, um, containing multitudes of information, um, as well as a, maybe a sort of key for uh, understanding Molly's maybe otherwise very complex, very dense, very full objects. And so you see in many of these works on this wall, um, many ideas that become trans sort of sketches perhaps or or they, they contain sketches they also contain very um what she would consider complete paintings um but we see different motifs uh different strategies for making her work that become apparent on the in the larger um fuller paintings that are seen elsewhere in the exhibition um and so my hope is that you would spend time as a visitor um, you can, you know, scan a, a code on the, there's a lot of work on this wall, you can scan a code on the wall and then um, look at your device to sort of see the title of every, of every work um, and know when it was made, uh, know when the specific object is made, and then hopefully there become threads that become apparent, or maybe we even see repeating marks, repeating gestures, repeating figures that um, continue in different places throughout the exhibition. These are more of the works that are on that wall. 
um, including a self-portrait by Molly um, from the early 2000s in the top left, which is before she attended graduate school um, and really learned more about painting. Um, she had no art education until she attended graduate school. Um, and then other reference points we see in the second image of Eve Babbitts and Marcel Duchamp's sort of famous image. Um, again, the sort of book structure dividing the two. And then we also, I'm including some, an image of Susan Sontag. Susan Sontag was very important, a sort of famous uh, image of her there that Molly has recreated from a famous photograph, I think, by Peter Hujar um, of Susan Sontag. And then there's a, a, um, a writing of Molly's in the top right, as well as a photograph in the sort of style of David Hockney of her view out of um, a studio in Chicago on the bottom of the Chicago skyline. This is more views of the gallery, including a major sculpture that is in the collection of the Walker Art Center on the ground here. Again, thinking about ideas of what paintings can be. So this is that sort of center um, portion of the sculpture on the ground is, is shredded canvas. Um, so again, thinking about this notion of comic relief as relief um, most largely being a, a word that we all know is ascribed to sculpture. So paintings that have moved to the, Molly has moved her paintings to the floor um, and they become something else entirely. And then the work that you see in the back there is a major work called Lurch, uh, which I like to, is, is a is very specific reference to a punk band in the nineties, but I also think of it as um, an homage to the character from the Adams family. The, very tall, bulky, hulking, lurch. Um, and then the last gallery of the exhibition um, contains a number of different ideas here. Um, some are, as you can tell, more complex uh, than others, um, but these are many experiments um, of Molly's and we have sort of have this, this table covered in aluminum foil as a device that Molly conceived to house these objects that are somewhere in between paintings and sculptures or works that can sit on the floor or sit on pedestals uh, rather than exist on the wall. Um, and Molly originally wanted to cover the walls with the aluminum foil, uh, which, um, you know, would have been a, another thread entirely, another way of thinking about pictorial devices, hanging devices, exhibition making devices. Um, but we settled on this on this uh, table, which is a very large table that was constructed specifically for the exhibition and then covered with this very thick sort of industrialized aluminum foil. And the sort of idea of the aluminum foil in many ways is uh, this notion of being able to reflect uh, and capture light. And so the table is, this room is quite bright uh, despite the sort of darker, um, almost forest green, peaceful green that is the wall um, because of this aluminum foil um, and its capacity to reflect light. So thinking about light here as, as knowledge, as ideas. Um, and so by having this table uh, centered in the room with all of these works of hers um, on top of them, the, the light, the ideas, the sort of brightness, the exchange um, is, is reflected back into the work. So sort of illuminating the sort of many ideas that Molly is trying to explore in the work. Um, and they also, it, this is getting into the weeds, uh, but it becomes about a sort of self-referential conversation. These objects having conversations with themselves and therefore are sort of a, a, a metaphor for the artist, again, being stuck in her own head, a sort of echo chamber of exchange um, and this table is surrounded by some other major works of Molly's. Um, these are some objects on the table, including these, these um, uh, wooden curves, as we see in the top left here. Uh, this notion of the curve has, um, is also a major theme, uh, which is Molly here thinking about sort of reducing, reducing compositional elements, you know, pure form, like the curve as a sort of essential uh, shape that is everywhere in our lives from a smile to um, a, a pencil to, um, you know, Molly, of course, takes it to a more intellectual thinking about, you know, this a sort of theoretical approach of a fallacy, which is a curve. Um, 
so re the re so thinking of of as a painter a gestural mark as a curve um and so these become she's quite literally made these curves reduced them down to their most basic form and made them art objects and then I have included these other images here as sort of reference points. We again see another shredded canvas object to the right of that, um, which has curves, you know, as we see in these, in the actual shreds of the canvas. And then the curve makes its way in the bottom left image. Um, this another curving shape on the wall. And then these are two paintings um, on the bottom right that uh, these curves are again replicated. So the sort of mark or the gesture of of fabric, um, of paint that becomes uh, an apparent formal device throughout the uh, throughout Molly's work. And then this is, I think, my last image. Um, as you exit the exhibition, we have these two uh, dirty window painting paintings uh, that Molly calls them dirty windows, as they were made quite literally in the same size and shape. Um, of dirty studio windows in various locations uh, in the in New England where Molly lives, um, and we we again sort of as a joking uh, gesture place them in direct conversation with actual windows window panes uh, immediately to the right, um, and we see here a sort of strategy of folding that maybe has been apparent in the other paintings that we see a way of pouring a treatment of uh, a treatment of paint so that again does not sort of adhere to what we would consider to be conventional media specific rules of what a painting is supposed to be um, historically. Um, and then just a quick little image here. This is our catalog. And if you are sort of interested or compelled by Molly's work, I hope that you might consider um, checking out our catalog, uh, which is a 220 page book. And it's the first major sort of monograph that really delves into her work and provides an overview of her practice, including a lot of works that are not in the exhibition um, and uh, different sort of analyses by art historians, a student, a former student of Molly's, um, as well as an archivist uh, of the sort of right girl cultural moment. Um, yes, thank you, everyone. And I think that's the end of my images here. And now I'm going to stop talking and uh, allow Stephen here to speak about our upstairs exhibitions. Thank you, Tyler. I'm gonna stop sharing if I can figure out how. Okay, so I'm going to jump right in and lead you through a walkthrough of our upstairs exhibitions, beginning with Carolyn Mosquita's Noctambules. And so just a few brief words on Carolyn's practice before we delve into this exhibition. She's an artist that was born in the Brittany region in France. Um, she did her BFA in Rennes. She studied at the Beaux-Arts in Paris and now currently lives and works in Marseille. So has had obviously a very good sort of expansive experience of the French countryside and landscape, but she also did a year of, of academic study in Los Angeles in 2014. And as part of that, did a road trip through New Mexico to Marfa and sort of spoke about her experience in the American countryside and of Texas and so when I first started conceiving this exhibition, I'd never met Carolyn, had never sort of seen the work in person, but I had seen her sort of growing profile in Europe. And you see an example um, on, on the right here, on the right side of the screen of some past work where Carolyn has become known for her very vivid kind of lustrous experiments with materiality. She's really interested in cut metal, in brass, She's moved into cut paper as well and creates these very carnivalesque vignettes, these spaces where these figures and suggestions of machinery and mechanics meet these sort of frivolous court Rococo like scenes of, of historical paintings. And she's especially interested in the evolving and oftentimes accelerating relationship between humankind and technology, between man and machine, and the sort of growing overlap, synergy, intermixture and cross-pollination that sort of takes place over the course of you know, the 20th century and into the 21st. 
And so with the Blaffer exhibition, we reached out to her. We wanted to commission something entirely new for our space and for our setting. Um, we were fortunate enough to get a French American cultural exchange grant, as well as a grant from Carolyn's region in France, which fueled and gave the foundation for Carolyn to create an entirely new piece that she sees as a singular installation. So as I walk you through it, you'll see components of sculpture and video and installation, but she really sees it as a single artwork. And she based Noctambule, which is French for night creatures or for night owls, on the concept of what would happen if an artist created an artwork and then that artwork came alive and started to return the favor or return some of the process upon the artist. And in doing this, she references the Pygmalion uh, myth, uh, which comes from Ovid's Metamorphoses. Some of you may be familiar with the stories of Pygmalion who was an accomplished sculptor um, who became increasingly disenchanted with women. He saw prostitutes sort of in his contemporary environment and he felt he became somewhat of a misogynist and he felt that his ideal woman could only live as he would sculpt her. And so he sculpted this perfect in his eyes idyllic woman in sort of the spirit of Aphrodite out of ivory. And you can see a couple of historical representations here, both painting and sculptor form um, of the way that he creates this, this figure. And then as the story goes, he pays homage to Aphrodite and Aphrodite pays him the gift of bringing this sculpture to life. And so as part of this, Pygmalion has created a very sumptuous bed for his sculpture and, and becoming his partner to, to lay in. And that will become important as I continue into the exhibition. And just one more representation here of this idea when Carolyn thought of what, it, what would happen if I created a sculptor and then that sculptor wanted to then re-sculpt me and reverse the process in some way. And so that gives you the foundation for Carolyn Mesquita's Noctambule. And so in the same way that Tyler walked us through the show, I'm gonna walk you through the exhibition. So when you come up on the second floor, you see sort of the beginning, the text, the introductory panel, as well as you can see there kind of in the right portion of the screen, this bronze figure or face. And so as you turn the cord and you start to walk down, you see this almost hallucinatory kind of representation that is part sculpture, part machine, and part human. Um, Carolyn calls this figure Roger. And as you get closer, you see that Roger is actually in juxtaposition and in proximity with another figure. And you're going to ultimately see that these become two representations of the two main protagonists in the stop motion video that really functions as the nucleus and the heartbeat of the show. Roger is this sort of machine-like, almost Frankenstein-like figure that takes on life through the artist. And the figure that we see on the left, as you'll kind of come to see in kind of a circular way, is a representation of the female protagonist, of the sleeper, of the dreamer, as well as the artist herself. And I really love this moment and, and kudos to Sean Fleming, our photographer, for really capturing this beautiful photo. And you can see kind of the suggestion or the curls of hair of this female. And you can see in a little more kind of detailed way, the way that Carolyn works with, you know, she loves brass because it's not bronze. It's not this sort of timeless, eternal, precious material. Brass in a lot of ways is seen as, as bronze as crass sort of stepsister, um, sort of seen as a more disposable commercial material, but she likes it because she can work with it in a, in a, in a more kind of visceral and, and kind of flux, flux way. And I just wanted to show you one more detail of the way that Carolyn also treats these metallic surfaces with paint and with a patina that gives them the sense of age and that they have kind of gone through a process, that they've lived a life and that they've taken on both of these scars, these marks, the history that lives in sort of abrasions and, and a working of a surface. And then as we walk into, into this gallery space, you can see that it's completely surrounded by black curtains. And so we wanted to move you away from the very geometric hard lines of the white cube and into this much softer kind of more organic dream chamber 
um, as, as Carolyn likes to say. And what you see here are representations of sculptures as well as figures that are ultimately going to become animate in her video. You see this snake figure on the left, this large iconic hand that sort of symbolizes the hand of the artist. And then in the, in the distance, a pair of prawns or shrimp. And then closer to when you first part the curtains, you also see this kind of comedic sort of more comical representation of a fish with multiple scales and eyes that also highlights, you know, Carolyn's just love of texture, of materiality, of surface, and the way that the light really plays upon and casts these really dramatic shadows. And speaking of, I wanted to highlight this one view of this hand and, and really the hand is very, a very crucial archetypal kind of figure or shape within the exhibition. But you also see all these fragments of brass that Carolyn is very purposefully, but also very kind of randomly just tossed across the floor with this idea that these sculptures are not fixed, that they've somehow come into being swirled into this current shape, but that they can just as easily kind of dissipate and turn back into fragments and sort of spread across the floor. Just one more really, I, I just love this view of the exhibition from the opposite side. So you kind of see the prawn and you see the way that these sculptures sort of weave you a path that ultimately turns you, oh, just one more view of, of the snake here in more detail, but ultimately they turn you towards the video. And, and so Carolyn has arranged these, these figures that ultimately become animated through this video. But what you're gonna see is that they're not quite the same. So the hand and the snake and the prawns and the fish that you've seen are not quite the same ones that you see in the video, but they're all kind of doppelgangers or surrogates or reflections. The same way that when we have a dream, it's not an exact one-to-one -one relationship. It's sort of a suggestion of a place or a figure or of a being that takes on a new life within our inner sort of mind and chamber. And so I'm going to play you now um, a quick one and a half minute clip of this 10 minute video. And I'm gonna speak a little bit over it as it's playing. And so what you're seeing here is one of the final scenes within this stop motion video. And so Carolyn has cast this young woman who is very much like a, a lookalike or a doppelganger of herself. And we saw that suggestion of the woman when we first walked in, but you remember the sort of small curls of hair. And this is a culminating scene in the video where we see this young female dreamer and she sort of never leaves her dream state, but she has these encounters with a fish-like figure, with a snake, with Roger in a sort of full body form. And ultimately at the end, this hand, this large brass hand, and if you can imagine, this is really the hand of the artist. The hand of the artist has now come in and sort of scooped up the female and it sort of has her in the palm of her hand. And then if you, were, if you recall back when I was mentioning Pygmalion and this idea of sort of fashioning this sumptuous bed for his muse and his sculpture come to life to live, we see the swelling of the bed here, almost like water-like as its draperies move and crest sort of rise up. And I just love the kind of the Baroque quality of this. And you're seeing sort of the last moments of this video as the, this bed and these draperies and all these art historical traditions ultimately swallow the female lead. But Carolyn doesn't leave the video quite here because what you're ultimately going to see is this figure then reaches out, pulls up a sheet of blue and we loop back to the beginning of the video. And so that is Carolyn Mosquita's Noctambules. I know we're sort of coming up on sort of the egg, closer to the end of our time. So I'm going to very quickly run you through the third exhibition that we have on display. Um, and I like that when Tyler sort of spoke about Chris Rock's Oscars and sort of this silhouetted surrogate of a performer and um, welcoming you into the space, you know, you saw that with Carolyn Mosquita's work. And then again, you see an animate performative body very much in the work of Maya Stovall. And so her exhibition is titled Raison, A Reason. Um, she is a, an artist in residence that we brought to the University of Houston to work with students to create a new performative work. Um, and so what I wanted to do is just kind of give you a brief overview of her practice. And really it hinges upon 
a confluence of the major elements within Maya's practice and study. She is a visual artist. She's also a choreographer and a dancer. She's called herself a radical ballerina. And she also has a PhD in anthropology. And she brings all of those elements together in this ongoing series of work that really began with what she called liquor store theater. And you're seeing a still of it here where she and a pair of collaborators went to corner liquor stores um, uh, within a particular neighborhood in Detroit. And this was inspired by Maya's sort of observation of these liquor stores where this was a very kind of economically depressed um, area within the city. And yet there was this whole culture and community that congregated around the liquor store for better and for worse. There were rituals, there were characters, there were sort of even the way that they spoke she kind of saw this theatrical, almost ballet-like element. And so she wanted to be an anthropologist as well as an artist in this sense. And so she went in and she started to create these simple choreographies to reflect some of the theater that she witnessed in the liquor store. And as local residents came up and asked what she was doing, that became the platform and the catalyst for her to stage these anecdotal interviews and to collect the sort of oral accounts and the oral histories of this place. And that becomes the crux of her work. This combination, these video pieces that mix performance and dance with ethnography and interview. And so she's now done this in a number of cities around the world. You see a still here from Our House Denmark in a body of work called Havna Plaz Den Ballet where she again performs and weaves her way through this public fountain. And again, uses that performance as the invitation to stage a number of interviews and conversations with residents of this major port city in Europe. She's also performed in Alta Park Plaza in San Francisco, um, one of the wealthiest enclaves within this California community. And she talks about how despite and almost beyond the performance that she does, her simply being a woman and a person of color inserting that body into a public space becomes a political, political action unto itself. And so she really starts to measure feelings, these vernacular moments of inclusion, exclusion, and what belonging and community mean within the various cities that she's worked. And so just to give you a little idea of this work, I'm gonna show just a one minute clip of liquor store theater. <coughs> Even this corner we're standing on, this used to be the wild, wild west. I mean, anything and everything was happening on this corner. But it seems to me that things change. Things are changing in our city. Uh, that is not uh, the normal, normal no more in front of liquor store. I mean, it, it can get wild, but we had, you know, at times to where, look, we in front of a pawn shop, pawn shop, and things was really uh, happening, happening. But they're they're calmed down, and it's and it's and it's it's really a uh, it's really a blessing and a good thing to come. So you get an idea there of Maya's work. You saw that resident of the community sort of sitting um, as they performed. And then through the act of that performance, he then get, gets into a conversation with Maya, sort of reminiscing about what that liquor store was, what it used to be, how that community and sort of the culture around it is evolving. And so Maya is really interested in the way that people ultimately come to define place. And so that work, that performative work has now led her into a sister series called Neon Theater. And you're seeing a few of the pieces here on display. And then this is a close up. And really this comes out of now Maya's increasing collaborative work with a community and with an archive. She starts to delve into important moments in American history 
that live outside the mainstream histories, marginalized histories that oftentimes speak of acts of both human accomplishment, artistic achievement, as well as moments of racial violence and prejudice and ways that that, that sort of violence has been enacted into policy. And so she's continued to add to these archives and literally and figuratively illuminating these dates and moments that live outside of and live in the shadows of mainstream narratives and histories. And so we invited Maya to come to Houston to work with a group of University of Houston students, and they created a whole sort of list of important dates, ultimately conducted a public vote and landed on an important date, 1970. I'm showing 1965 here, but 1970 was the new work that they created to honor sort of a Houston history. That was the founding of La Raza Unida, which was a Mexican-American third party um, to compete against the Republicans and the Democrats within the larger sort of national political scope. Maya also creates these abstract neons. And you know, for any of you familiar with Houston and the place that Dan Flavin has within um, you know, Houston art history and the Menil collection. This is Maya's attempt to translate that neon theater, those dates and the theories of history into the way that light can actually shape our path and our interaction with architecture. And then I wanted to close with the culmination of all of this work is actually Maya will be creating a new performance that will be performed this Thursday at three o'clock. Um, please disregard that 6.30 p.m. there. That was an early version of this uh, poster. But ultimately, Maya is going to perform. She's bringing collaborators in. She, the working group of students, they will perform at the Blaffer. They will move to the University of Houston Library, the Fountain Plaza, and then it will culminate with Maya in conversation with one of the co-founders of La Raza Unida, Dr. Jose Angel Gutierrez. So bringing together, again, dialogue and performance which is really kind of the, the, the foundation and the core of Maya's work. So I'm going to um, stop sharing and thank you very much um, for listening to Tyler and I today. And James, I'm not sure if we're, if we're going to take questions. Um, Let me come back. Yes, I'm, yes. Oh, great job, by the way, guys. Fantastic. Thank you. Hey, great job. Yes, so I am. I was looking in the comments, and unfortunately, I did not see any questions. I'm just, maybe everyone's at the rodeo this morning, <laughs> but that's the, that's the beauty of the, the virtual world. So it will be posted. It will be on there, and then typically most, um, most of our views do tend to go up after it's already posted to Facebook. So hopefully we'll see a, a bit more outreach on the, um, on the back end. Well, great job, by the way. Great. Okay. Fantastic job. Uh, Matt, I don't know if I you have any questions. I would like to ask a question, please. I like ask, asking curators the, this question. What is your favorite work in the exhibit? Oh, man. Um, I quite oh. enjoy <laughs> I, sorry, I'm stumped. I mean, I got 120 objects to pick from. Um, I quite, I mean, I, I quite enjoy the little vignette, if you might remember, in Molly's exhibition of the three major paintings, one including the comic relief, comic relief may be my favorite. Um, the one, the one with the, the sort of the clown arms sort of emerging from the painting. It's just such a, bright and cheerful but bizarre sort of collection of ideas um and it's I, I it's something that i always sort of come back to i also really enjoy uh carolyn's video itself i mean i encourage i encourage everyone to come to the museum because experiencing carolyn's show in person i mean it really is once you enter on the other side of that curtain it is like a, a you have no idea where you are. It's completely dark with sort of these spotlit moments. It's a very surreal experience. Yeah, and if I may, I really like, um, I love the dirty windows in Molly's exhibition. I think that really speaks to the idea of that windows are supposed to be this portal of clarity onto the world. And yet Molly has sort of covered it with these sort of abstract and very colorful kind of suggestions of what painting can be. Um, but I like, you know, also the hand of the artist. And I feel that's present in comic relief with the three hands. 
but also the big hand within Carolyn's work. Because to me, it speaks to, you know, Michelangelo's, the creation of man and the Sistine Chapel, Adam Smith's invisible hand of the economy. I remember learning about Jan van Eyck and the try to the erasure of the hand of the artist because it was meant to be that God had sort of gifted this work of art to the people. And so all the ways that the hand has functioned sort of archetypally within art history, to me, it kind of has takes on a real kind of visceral and immediate presence in Carolyn's work. So that kind of stands out for me, I think, is something that that really resonates. Yeah, that that large hand, it's I love the placement of it in that room, the lighting of it. I love that photo of it. Uh, yeah. However, what she did with that stop motion video, um, that's impactful in just so many different ways. And that really jumped out at me, even on my computer screen. No, thank you. And you can imagine a 10 minute video. I don't know how many, like how many weeks that takes her to create, you know, and then she's got a sound artist that she works with. And so it very much becomes a production, you know, and I love that audiences of all kinds with all familiarity levels of art have really been captivated by that video. You just kind of want to see what happens next. And so to me, it speaks to kind of the skill of the filmmaker. And I don't think Carolyn would ever call herself that, but to kind of pull you in and keep you intrigued and keep you sort of wanting to know where this path is ultimately going to take, I think is very, very present within that, that piece. Yeah, that was, really, uh, that was really interesting. So thank you for indulging one of my favorite questions to ask uh, guys like you. And I, I love that it kind of stops you in your tracks a little bit because you live with the work and you have a different relationship than you know a first time viewer or the artist. You know, the curator's relationship to a body of work like this really is unique. Completely. Um, yeah. And you know, it's, sometimes it's hard because it's like asking what your favorite, who your favorite child is. You yeah. know, I think that both Tyler's had this experience of you're spending so much time and it becomes this sort of family and that you don't want to elevate one above another, but there are certain, and sometimes that relationship evolves over the course of an exhibition. You know, sometimes you really get to like, and you, you develop a, a greater affinity for works in the show, the more that you live with the exhibition. Yeah, as a collector, it, it, it's a similar thing if someone comes in and says, you know, Matt, what's your favorite work in your collection? What? <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I like to ask the question. So yeah, thank thank you for indulging. Absolutely. Sure. Um, I think that's just a good way to, to wrap things up. Uh, again, guys, um, thanks for your time. Thanks for your expertise. Uh, so we'll sign off the formal program now. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I was going to bring people up to date since this is March of 2022 and someone might be watching this in the future, what I'm about to say is gonna be old news. <laughs> uh, so you, you guys can sign off. I'm gonna take just a minute here to, uh, I don't know if I'm reminding people or informing people about the two exhibits that we have coming up. I'm looking at my cheat sheet. So for the first time ever, VAA is producing two exhibits in two months. Uh, it's kind of exciting. We're returning to live exhibitions. We've had a year and a half of virtual exhibit exhibitions. Uh, both of these are going to be at Sabine Street Studios in the Sawyer Yards Complex. The first one is our 38th juried membership show. The juror is Lester Marks. The call for entry has closed. The uh, notifications to artists are going to be in the next uh, week or so. The opening is April 4th. The current call for entries that is open is for the 38th jury open exhibition. Allison Delima Green, the curator of contemporary art at MFA is the esteemed juror for that exhibit. That call for entries is open. It is accessible on our website. The deadline for entries is the end of this month, March 30th, and it will be on exhibit May 8th to June 11th. So we got a show in April, we got a show in May. Uh, it's, it's interesting seeing how many more, we had 25% more artists enter this membership show than last year's. I think we've really seen a depression of creativity uh, in this virtual world. And I'm very happy that VAA can encourage uh, creativity you know, among its members and interested parties. So Lester has works from 100 artists that he's currently going through. And we'll see you know, how many artists enter um, Allison's show. You know, we won't know till 
uh, March 30th again, March 30th. So it really is exciting. I hope everyone can wrap their brain around the fact that we're doing two shows back to back. Uh, they are related, but they're not because they're completely different jurors. So for artists, this is an opportunity to build your exhibition uh, resume. And for collectors, this is an opportunity to buy um, vetted works from artists uh, directly for their studio prices. VAA does not take commission on sales. Uh, it's all about uh, keeping the art artist front and center. So I think it's great. I hope uh, if you're an artist, you enter. If you're a participant, you, you know, come to the reception, you get to see it in person. Uh, so that's kind of the up-to-date news for now. Uh, look forward to seeing people at our third Monday, which is frankly my pet project in the organization. I love critique night. I love doing that. We do do that in person at Archway Gallery uh, on Dunleavy Street. You don't have to bring work, but you have to bring your opinion because everyone talks about everyone's work. This is a, uh, a peer critique. This is not an academic critique. Uh, so come check it out. I would love to see you. Uh, that's, I think that's enough for now. And uh, maybe I'll see critique night. Maybe I'll see you at the exhibit. Maybe I'll see you next month at the educational program. So on behalf of the board of directors and all of the members of Visual Arts Alliance, we wish you a good day. Bye now. All right, bye.